Lance George will be making the next presentation. Lance is the Housing Assistance Council's Research and Information Director. Uh, there he provides research information, public relations, and communication activities to further knowledge of rural housing policy issues and trends. He has authored several publications, including Taking Stock, which I hope all of you are familiar with, an overview of rural America's residents, their economic condition, and their homes. Lance's research and policy analysis at HACC encompasses a, way, a wide array of issues and topics related to rural housing. Before coming to HACC, Lance worked for Frontier Housing Incorporated, a nonprofit organization that builds affordable homes for low-income families in Appalachian, Eastern Kentucky. Lance. Thank you, Moises, and um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be around many familiar faces and old friends. Um, we wanted to just very briefly um, provide a kind of a demographic overview to help set up the, the larger plenary discussion today. I hope Moises didn't build it up too much. We're going to go over um, just some basic trends and patterns, um, again, to help set up the discussion. This is really a reprise of a previous discussion that we had hosted by the Federal Reserve um, and we, we, we went back and looked at it and thought um, to broaden the scope, because that, that presentation really focused solely on housing issues or largely on housing issues. And when, you, when we look back at some of these issues, and we've been doing some work on this for quite some time, that in, in many respects, some of the largest housing challenges are not housing challenges at all. They're related to the larger social, economic, and demographic characteristics of the communities we live and work in. So, we went back and looked at that, and this presentation will be, again, a reprise, but we'll focus more on those social, economic, and demographic patterns. Um, it's entitled Ruralities. Um, that's a kind of a feeble attempt at a play on words on my part. Um, I, but many of you know I don't live in reality. I'm kind of chained to a desk in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and, and I only say that partly in jest, quite frankly. Um, I am now for better or mostly for worse, um, an urban person. I've lived in Washington, D.C. now nearly 20 years. Um, and I am of the oft now derided professional class. So that really kind of there's a large kind of gulf, I think, um, in the past few weeks we've seen a gulf in some of these issues. So in some respects, some of you know me, I might have a foot in both worlds. Um, but we really wanted to kind of present this. I think. This has been an, an anathema, what's happened recently in the last few weeks, kind of an anathema or an epiphany or uh, an enigma to some people. But quite frankly, many of these characteristics or trends we think have been happening for a long time. And that's what we've really focused on today is looking at, and it's really the, the, uh, the operative word here is the changing. So we're looking at a time series. Um, but we really kind of, I think some of these, they're, and these are not controversial, many of these issues you've heard about, but we want to show them how they manifested over time, and especially in rural communities. It's our thought that oftentimes these issues are thought about largely from an urban context. So um, one of the first ruralities that we'll mention is... Um, so I'm, I'm often naked without my slides here, but I'm trying to present or trying to um, forward the first slide. And there we go, rurality number one. Rural America ain't what it used to be. Now, you could, you could read a lot into that, but I have only from my perspective numerically. So for most of our nation's, our country's history, we've been largely a rural nation. Um, and that changed sometimes in, in the 1920s or 30s when more people started living in kind of cities and suburbs than did in the countryside. Um, but, and we've seen a more accelerated, kind of unabated trend towards urbanization. So we're taking a relatively long-term look here, but I just want to show you kind of a long-term pattern of what I would call another rurality over the last hundred years. And this is a, a relatively long look. Um, I don't know if I'm, there we go. So basically on this, on this map, all these, the states, any state that is in green has at least 25% or more of its population um, that was considered rural. And this is in 1910. So in 1910, more than half, roughly 54% of the U.S. population was kind of classified as rural. And we have them in quartiles. So the darkest color is 75% rural. The lighter colors are below 50%. And the lightest colors, um, more than 25%. So these are going to go relatively slow. We were going to focus through 
Um, I might ask the, the, the staff to kind of, there we go. So that's, I'm going to go in 20 year increments here. So that's 1930. And again, if it's a green state, it has more than 25% of its population as rural. 1950, 1970, 1990, and 2010. So you'll notice um, there were more than 20, count, or 20 states in 1910 that had more than 75% of their population as rural. Today, roughly, there are only about four states that have more than half of their population that are rural. A second rurality is that some communities are hemorrhaging population. Some rural communities are just absolutely losing population. Again, an often discussed topic, but we wanted to take a longer term perspective and look at this and also not look just at population loss, but specific elements of population loss. So the first map just simply indicates all counties that lost population, if they're colored on this map at the blue or green, um, or the green shades, they lost population between 2000 and 2010. And the darker blue shades indicates a higher percentage of population loss over that time period. But we think this is a relatively simplistic look at that, quite frankly. And we wanted to kind of um, dial the, the, the microscope in and look at it somewhat more closely, especially around two specific age cohorts. Now, there, again, these are often well-tried um, or well-discussed patterns, but we wanted to look at the younger working age population. The oft-used term, the brain drain, um, especially younger working age population migrating out of rural communities. Um, so we wanted to give a, a geographic distribution and show that relatively quickly. So all of the counties in green, and this is 1980, all of the counties in green had more than 20, 25%, more than a quarter of their population age 18 to 30 in 1980. So if you go to 1990, 2000, and 2010. And what you see is, now there's some natural population change here, quite frankly, dealing with the baby boom generation, but in many respects, you see an out-migration of younger and working age population consistently age 18 to 30, and especially those with, with advanced degrees or higher education degrees. Just a large out-migration. And you, you seem to have a very serious imbalance where you have largely an older population or a younger age po population that has a lower education attainment level. In many of these green counties, they're metropolitan areas or they're college towns, quite frankly. You'll see that kind of dramatic trend. On the other side of the equation, Most of these communities are also getting older. And some of this is a, is a reaction to the natural population loss, but we are also just naturally aging as a nation as well, right? But it's exacerbated in some of these communities by these demographic outshifts. So again, a geographic kind of illustration of this. Um, this is the over age 60 population in 1980. So all of the brown or tan colored counties had more than one fifth of their population age 60 or over, and the darker brown counties indicate counties that had more than 25% of their population age 60 and older. So we go to 1990, 2000, and 2010. And again, a lot of this, some of this is, is natural population. You have kind of many, you know, this is multidimensional in some direction, but in, in many respects, this is a, another factor of this out-migration of younger and working age populations where you just have a serious imbalance, possibly in the viability of many communities. A third reality, and we only have five, rurality, we only have five of them. Um, rural areas are becoming more diverse. I think there's been a lot of discussion, again, in the last couple of weeks about white rural Americans. It is true that most rural areas are more homogeneous and less racially and ethnically diverse than our urban and suburban communities. But there's, there's also an unabated trend towards diversity in this nation, and we'll try to illustrate that here as well. So this is slightly different. I'm going to ask you to kind of think a little more about this. But this is the change in the minority population between 1980 in 1990. So any county that had a, a pink or more reddish tone actually show, had an increase in its minority population between 1980 and 1990. The blue counties didn't. They saw a decrease or no gain in minority population. And minority would be um, non-white um, or, or in Hispanic. 
So in 1990, this is the increase in, in minority population. We see some very dramatic, some of the largest gains in minority population between this period, between 1990 and 2000. And some of this is simply a fact that there were very few minorities in many of these communities to start with. That's why you have the thousand percent increase, right? Um, and finally, 2000 to 2010, again, almost, the larger story here, I think, is almost all of the counties, most rural counties, experienced three successive decades of population, minority increases in the minority population. Again, still not as diverse as urban areas, but this is definitely a trend. Um, and most of this population, almost exclusively, is largely Hispanic influx, uh, a, a, a Hispanic population growth. That's a major component, a major trend. If it weren't for the has Hispanic growth in many of these communities, there would be even larger population loss, and population loss just generally across the board in rural communities. The fourth rurality. Rural incomes have stagnated. Again, a very general trend. We hear this, but we're trying to illustrate it in rural communities and what is it meant in rural communities. So this is a little harder to see with the projection on the colors, but this is basically median, real uh, in, uh, inflation adjusted median household incomes in 1993. This is the kind of earliest data that we have good kind of sound or the latest data that we have good sound kind of county level data. The lighter blue areas indicate a much lower income, indicate an in, a lower household median income. Going through to the blue and the pink or the fuchsia are the higher income communities. So again, holding these constant and holding all, the, all of the categories constant, we're going to do this in, in kind of 10 year increments. In 2003, a very similar pattern, again, lighter blue. Um, and, and areas of, of kind of darker blue to pink show a higher income. And in 2013, so I think the larger pattern we've seen on some of the other slides was there was a lot of change. The larger pattern here was that there was no change, really. Very little change in incomes. So we did a, a relatively quick, and this is a crude calculation, all of the light blue counties actually had a decline in median incomes um, between 1993 and 2013. I know there are some economists and some highly advanced academics and scholars in the room. This is one area where we could slightly be questioned, so we tried to, to cover our flank a little bit here. This is, this is a slightly more complicated issue. So we did run some more advanced models, some tests of statistical significance. Um, just, just to cover my backside, because I know I could, get, I could get harassed on that about changes in income. That's a more dynamic factor that you need to account for. So we did some tests of statistical significance to back some of this up. The, the fuchsia areas, the pinker areas, indicate statistically significant increases over these two periods in, in incomes. Some of that you'll notice is directly related to the fuel boom, the energy boom, and the fracking boom. There's no doubt about that. The darker blue areas indicate absolute statistical decline in incomes over this period. The lighter blue areas indicate no statistically significant change in income. And I think in many respects that's kind of a dull outcome, but that's the larger story. There's been virtually no income gains across much of the U.S. over the past 20 years. Absolutely none. Um, and if you look at some of the other measures, it's actually a decline of about 1.8 percent. So um, that's the larger story, and I think that's a larger story kind of in relation to some of the work that we've been doing. Um, I know we're going to talk about poverty more, but I think some of this issue about just looking at incomes generally is an important component of what we need to be thinking about. Rally number five, most Americans, or most, most rural Americans live in high quality housing. Some of the, some of the ruralities that we've present, been presenting aren't as, um, aren't as pleasant or aren't as positive. Um, I think, quite frankly, this is a, a positive element or attribute. Um, um, in many respects, most rural Americans live in high-quality housing for a range of factors, but some of that is by the direct work that many of you have done in this room over the last 30 or 40 years. Now, it's hard to, hard to kind of establish that, but I know you've worked very hard to eliminate some of the most egregious, egregious housing conditions. When we first started this work, the biggest housing challenge, or I'm sorry, when the Housing Assistance Council first started 45 years ago, the largest housing challenge, I was born in, so I'm the 45 for 45, I was born two days after the Housing Assistance Council started. So I'm, with, I'm right at 45, so that, but um, the biggest housing challenge was substandard and inadequate housing. Um, but you'll see, and we'll try to illustrate how that's improved. 
I do say there's a big but here, though. There's a kind of a large but. But this is a map. All these counties in purple in 1970, more, if, they're, if they're in purple, they had more than 2.5% of their housing units lacking adequate plumbing, a very basic component of housing quality and a kind of an egregious standard. And the darker the purple, the greater the concentration of substandard or homes lacking adequate plumbing. And this is just a quick run through um, in 1980. Again, all the purple counties are those that have more than 2.5% lacking adequate plumbing. 1990, 2000, and then this one went to 2014. So I think many of you are to be commended for some of these gains, but there's a large but there. You'll still see dramatic kind of areas of purple, quite frankly. Many of them concentrated on or near Native American lands, quite frankly. Um, so we still have a lot of work to do, and I, and I think some of these numbers are underrepresented about the substandard housing. I've driven through some of these communities. I'm not out there as much as you are. They don't take into account homes that aren't, you know, that, that, that are vacant homes, and you see a lot of kind of dilapidated vacant homes. But at the same time, I think this is a kind of a positive story, but we still have work to do. This is, you know, the, the public health world talks about kind of eradicating diseases or eradicating problems. This is, this is an embarrassment, and this is something that's within reach. There's only a couple hundred thousand homes that lack adequate plumbing. We could, with a modicum of resources, we could eradicate this problem. Um, and rurality, I, I put this as 5.5. Um, and I would say, you know, most rural, Ameri most rural Americans live in, in high-quality housing. Many of them that we work with don't. But the, some of the larger challenge, and there's an and or a but, I would say, um, is that we have changing or shifting. That's what the whole discussion is about. It's a changing focus on rural America. The larger discussion is, um, or the larger challenge now, it kind of evolved to housing affordability. So that's our largest challenge about housing. And you're, many of you are housers in the room. You, you understand this well. Um, Housing affordability has become the largest housing challenge. So the counties in, in orange or any shade of red or orange had more than one quarter of their population or one more quarter of their households that had affordability challenges, paid more than 30% of their monthly income. And this is in 1980. You fast forward to 1990, 2000, and 2014. So... You know, it, it, it's pretty clear, and some these are some of the some of the very you know the very large challenges that we're dealing with. I wanted to set the stage. I had a couple more, but I think I'm going to stop right there because I think that's a good segue to talk about some of these issues um, in, in in what's really going on in the in the community. So I'm really looking forward to kind of our expert panel, um, and we thank you all. Thank you very much.